HTTP 499 status code. What is it? What does it mean? If you look around the internet, they will tell you all sorts of fun things and they will get it wrong almost every time. It's crazy. The internet, it has information that's wrong. What do you know? Well, I'm going to prove it to you today as well. Check it out. Let's start out. What is even the 499 status code? Guess what? It's when a client sends a fin to Nginx before Nginx has a chance to respond. And this is a scenario here that I've drawn up for you in the 200 HTTP OK status when the client connects it will send a HTTP request forward slash something to an API endpoint. Either it's gonna fetch a file or get some JSON data back from a database. So the request comes in, let's do a quick walkthrough. Client sends a request. This Nginx will send that request onward to an upstream, which is probably Node.js, maybe running Express, some Mongo as well in a database. And then it will fetch that data, send a response back to the client, and guess what? The client will receive a response. That's a 200. This is a good scenario. That's a happy path. However, Nginx will give you a 499 under this one condition. Here is the example. Client sends their request just like before. Nginx forwards that request onward to your Nginx uh, upstream here, which is Node.js. Guess what? Your client, it will abort that request before a response comes in. This will generate the 499. This is the case and the only case when Nginx logs a 499 and you will want to make sure to track those and we'll talk a little bit more about that. The HTTP status code 499 can happen for various reasons. For example, uh, the user will cancel request usually before uh, the server can respond to an API call. Now there's various reasons that the client might want to cancel the request and that's because the client has a timeout set for the request. For example, it sets it to five seconds. After that five seconds, it will send a TCP fin to the server and then Nginx will log a 499. The client won't see anything. It gets nothing because it terminated the connection. So there's nothing to be sent uh, back to the client. It will receive a fin ACK, but it won't receive anything else. Another reason that the client would trigger a, a, a request abort, you know, a cancellation to send a fin, the server is slow, the API server is slow, so that timeout will tick. That could be a reason why that you're seeing these 499s. Uh, and there's a couple of really legitimate use cases where this will occur. The client will close the connection uh, due to closing the app directly or closing the browser. And in that case, the browser or the app might have an in-flight request. The user will choose to exit the app or the browser and that will cancel the request. The browser will cleanly close the connection, sending a TCP fin to the web server. And that is a legitimate reason that you will see these 499s. Um, uh, another reason here is when the user clicks a cancel button. For example, they submit a request, the user interface provides a cancel button to the user and they will click it maybe because it's going slow or they really wanted to change their submission to the server. There's a cancel button that will also trigger a 499. These things will happen and it's intended, it's by design and it's not always a problem. It's actually probably business as usual. So guess what? 499 status codes, they're your friend. There is a problem though when the 499 status codes start going up on a chart. That can indicate a problem. Maybe your server slow and things like that. So in order to fix these 499s, uh, if you're starting to see an increase in 499s, you might want to increase the client timeout setting. For, was it five seconds? Maybe make it 10 seconds. Maybe your server needs a little bit more time for some of those slower API calls. If you're really seeing a lot of problems with these 499s and you're seeing a continue upward trend, your server is maybe it's out of capacity, it's getting a lot of API calls and the CPU is going to the roof or it just has exhausted some sort of resource, you might need more, more servers and more capacity there. So that's another one. Also, maybe it could be an architecture problem from a uh, software design perspective. You might have hit some sort of bottleneck in the design of the software and you'll have to go back to the drawing board and make some adjustments there as well. That could also help solve that. Obviously, that's a, you know, a longer fix, but in that case, that will also be a way to improve these 499s. Always expect 499s in your logs. You want to track those and monitor those so you can indicate a problem. However, you'll typically see a steady state of 499s. These are things that you want to see in your logs because it's common scenario situations. So make sure to monitor those 499s, but generally they're okay. HTTP 499 status code, there's a lot of information on the internet that's wrong. Let's start off really quick, check this out. I wanna show you something 
where the internet got it wrong. We have one of the prevailing top Google search results here where we get information, we log, we go to Google, we type in 499 status code, one of the web pages pops up and it gives you information that's totally wrong. This is completely incorrect. Check this out on multiple levels. It's kind of crazy. They say here, the, the scenario is, is, you know, it's related to timeouts. However, say the client sends a request to the Internex web server. The Internex web server students that up to a WordPress backend upstream service. And then a proxy timeout occurs here on Nginx. And in the diagram, it shows that it returns a 499 error. That's wrong. First off, there's no status code that can be returned to the client because the only way a 499 can be generated is if a client is going to be canceling the request midstream. And in that case, it sends a fin over to Nginx and Nginx will send a fin act back. This happens completely outside of the HTTP layer. This happens below that at the TCP layer and there could be no status codes exchanged between the client and the server. So guess what? Completely wrong on this level. Also, a 499 cannot be generated here between WordPress and Nginx because that kind of timeout will generate a 504 gateway timeout error. We're going to demonstrate that here just to show you exactly what that looks like. Let's go on over to our terminal window. We're going to start up a Docker proxy that starts running some processes. We're also going to log uh, some TCP activity. All right, we have our Docker Nginx running, then we have our TCP running here, our TCP tracker, and we're going to send a happy path over to uh, the, we're going to expect a 200 status code. Okay, here we go. So we got a 200 status code here uh, for a uh, simple API call. And we also see the request cycle running through. Uh, let's check a look. I'm kind of curious to see what that looks like. Um, okay, so we send over the request here. You can actually see the payload uh, and then um, it's it does some acts back and forth. It receives a response and then it is happy. So this is the happy path. Now let's simulate a scenario where we trigger a 499, right? This is the only scenario that you'll see a 499. I'm going to issue a request and then I'm going to cancel it immediately. Now what you see here is Nginx logs a 499. However, the client got nothing back. This is exactly how it works and the only way that it works. Even, even if the internet tells you something different, you gotta be careful because this is, this is the path and this is how it works. So we see I, I made a call to the server, but I immediately canceled it. Uh, and essentially that's the abort, right? I'm aborting the request, sending a TCP fin to the server and the server acknowledges back with a, with a fin act essentially here. So this is where the 499 is logged. And that is the scenario when you get a HTTP status code 499. All right, now I'm gonna to demonstrate to you a 504 gateway timeout, which the other website here got it wrong. That's not where the 499 is. When this connect, when this scenario happens here, that's described on the website, you'll get a 504 gateway timeout. Let's check this out. All right, here we go. I'm going to simulate a 504 gateway timeout. Boom, operation timed out. There you go, 504 gateway timeout error. Nginx will log it here as a gateway timeout. Uh, 504 status code. This is when Nginx timeout is triggered. And in that case, the upstream proxy server uh, took too long to respond and it triggered a 504 and Nginx responding back to the client. Guess what? That's the scenario that you'll see when Nginx times out. If the client cancels the request, you'll get a 499. If Nginx detects a slow upstream, it's gonna send you a 504 gateway timeout. At PubNub with our API, we actually see quite often several 499 status codes throughout the day and that we expect to see those. These are a common steady state amount of traffic on our network. And what we see those in those scenarios are specifically when clients unsubscribe from channels. We'll see a 499 status code essentially saying unsubscribe. And we track that information and we count it within our system. This is critical details for us. We do track this on a regular basis and it's a, a very common scenario. So these 499 status codes, even though it's outside of the 200 range, it is business as usual for us. It's actually not really an error. And it is something that we value highly in terms of analytics and metrics and tracking and overall status of the network. We typically see a lot of 499s, essentially almost a one-to-one -one because clients are opening connection and then they are subscribing to data and then eventually they're going to be saying unsubscribe which sends a TCP fin to close the connection and we log that as a 499. We also see this when adding or removing channels into a multiplex subscription. I, I have channel A comma B comma C and then I might want to remove comma C the last channel on there so I'm back down to two channels 
And guess what? That scenario will trigger an unsubscribe from the multiplex and then a resubscribe with the new multiplex. So, so we only trigger uh, events on channels A and B. Those are scenarios that we see when uh, 499 status codes show up in our logs. What happens if the device disappears? Say, for example, the Wi-Fi is turned off where it's no longer able to reach the network. In this case, if your client has sent a request to the server and the server is still working on that and is processing it, but the device disappears, this is a very interesting case and we do see this quite often at PubNub because we have over a billion connected devices. So this scenario shows up every single minute where the device, it just disappears, it goes away. However, since there's no traffic or information that's exchanged between the client and server when that happens, we don't know that the device disappeared, that is no longer able to receive packets and data. So what we will do is eventually when we have the data available and ready for the client, we'll attempt to send it back to the IP address associated with the client device. But guess what? The client device essentially, nothing, it's, it's gone. There's nothing to deliver to the client. And we will log that as a 200 because there's no, no other way for us to know. Now. This is a very common scenario for all web servers and all API calls, everything along those lines. We have accomplished this advanced capability at PubNub to detect these scenarios in situations called PubNub Presence. We have the ability to track the connectivity of client devices. And this is something that we've built into our system and our API platform. When a device disappears, we're able to track that information and provide those details to you. This is an advanced capability on our network that we're offering as an API service called PubNub presence. Under normal scenarios without PubNub presence in the existing world today, the device would just disappear. You wouldn't know about it. It's just gone. And to your web server, everything looks like it's completely fine. However, the device is gone. With PubNub presence, we are able to track that information and give you a full account end to end, start to finish the device's connectivity and its status. This is something that we've built globally distributed across all of our data centers and it is available to you through a simple API. All right, one of the main takeaways here for the HB 499 status code is that it's not an error. It's not a server error. This is client initiated. So it's in that 400 range, right? It's not gonna be a 500 because a 500 is resolved on the server side. The server recognizes that it is, it ran into an error, a timeout error, upstream error, server error, stack traces, those are all status 500s. When a client initiates an error, that's gonna be a 400 range, right? The client did something wrong, it sent the incorrect data, payloads were wrong, insufficient access, uh, or it terminates the connection, and that could be a 499 status code. Um, also, just in general, even though it says 499, it's not a 200, it almost is business as usual. It's not really an error. It's something that is should be treated as a normal type scenario. If you see them, don't be afraid. They're actually okay. This is something that you'll see on a regular basis. What you really do want to check is a chart. Chart that over time. You should see a steady state over time. If you see it increasing suddenly, therein lies a problem. And so you want to track 499. If they're your friend. They can tell you a lot of details about your network and your API servers. However, don't be afraid of them because they are common and standard. Don't try to get rid of them. They are something that are going to be there. They are your friend and off you go.